Hello and welcome to Psychology in Seattle. I'm your host, Kirk Honda, professor and licensed therapist. And I'm Humberto Castaneda. I am Professor Kirk's cousin. No, you're not. I know, I'm not your cousin. I'm a cryptozoologist. Interesting. So today we are doing another episode on art therapy. We have a guest, special guest, back on the show, Rebecca Bloom. Woo! She's in the camera. <laughs> are you in the camera? Uh, welcome back to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks, Kirk, for yeah. having me. And my cat is also yes. in the show. Uh, thanks, Umberto, for being a participant a second time in art therapy. A dummy. <laughs> yeah. so Crash test dummy. We brought you on the show because you just published a book yes. called Square the Circle. And I'm so proud to know the author of an actual book. Woo! Thank you. And so we thought you'd have you on the show to demonstrate the usefulness of this book and who you want to buy it and why you made it. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so uh, this cat is really... <laughs> cat, you have to go away for now. You're on the set. So I'm so excited. This book took eight years to make. Many, many drafts. Uh, many great graphic artists worked on it with me. And it's all of my directives that are original to me. Um, everything in here was kind of crafted by me and people I know. Um, Did, do you use these with your clients? Uh, many of these are used with my clients. Many of these things in here I hand draw on a regular basis, so it's funny to have them pre-printed. <laughs> um, and then I'm having the interesting experience of people now coming back to me, like, you wrote this in the introduction, and I'm really thinking about this part of you, and it's a little disconcerting <laughs> <laughs> um, to have that stuff out in the world, but it's been really fun. Yeah, so you can order it on Amazon or through BookLocker. It's only thirteen ninety five, or maybe on Amazon it's like twelve ninety five. You have racy uh, pictures, from what I can yes, see. Yes, I have an hourglass mm, figures. Hourglass figures. Why is it called Square the Circle? That is a Joan Kellogg concept. She created a card test called Mari, and to square the circle is to kind of be at the pinnacle of your life, um, and. That's, this book is about exploring a lot of dimensions, but definitely feeling in control of your life. It's also an ancient math problem yep. to square the circle. And it was, it was, it was a, a, an unsolvable problem for most of history. Thousands of years. Yeah, because, uh, so, the Greeks, uh, they, the Greeks didn't have algebra, really, but they had ways to do uh, math using... Uh, visual like aids like lines and they could draw circles with compasses and things uh, but so they didn't have a, a, a way to essentially make a circle or sorry a square that had the same area as a circle just using those mechanics and mostly it had to do be, it was mostly because pi is part of the equation of a circle's area and pi is a turns out to be a, a transcendental irrational transcendental number and they didn't know this but essentially that that was at the root of why they couldn't do it with those simple tools. Now, we can do it just with algebra, but um, for most of history, it was like, uh, it was, and it was, then it became a metaphor for like impossibility. Like, right. you can't do this. You can't square the circle. Right. So I had a lot of fun looking into all that history and thinking about problems that we've been sorting over for thousands and thousands of years. And um, then I had a fascinating conversation with my friend who's a mathematician about once it was solved, it didn't really change anything, <laughs> which I thought was totally fascinating. So right. it seemed like a very fitting title. And then the whole first section of the book is all of the, <laughs> the working titles over the eight years. One of the working titles was Ohm Art, um, which I thought would attract every yogini in the world to me. But it ended up that I didn't know enough about yoga to really own the turn. Om art, and I had to come up with a term that I can. Om art. Om, like Om art. Om mm. art. Oh, I see. But it, I can't really own it, so it it ended up not working out. But I can own square the circle, and it brings up really lively conversations. Um, so that's why. Well, I it's, it's interesting you mentioned the thing about like when it was solved, it didn't really uh, have the impact you would have thought. And I think part part of it is that it wasn't solved in the in the original rules that were laid out mm. because. The, the original rules actually are still impo it's, it's still impossible to do it uh, what they call algebraically, which is with mm. these discrete ways to do it. Uh, but it's almost like uh, you change the rules and now you can do mm. something that you couldn't do, which is also an interesting metaphor, like mm. looking at something, it's impossible, but then if you look at it from a different angle or change the rules, you know, 
you can like, hey, a right. touchdown, it's not going that way. No, no, a touchdown's going the other way. Yeah, that's right. Right, yeah. <laughs> so then you can, you know, change the score of the game. Right. Everything in here could go a thousand different directions. And that's the other part about squaring the circle is over thousands of years, if you go on the internet and you type in square the circle and go to the image icon, there are a gazillion different ways that people have tried to do it over the years. And then if you look at the cover, um, I have been playing with squares and circles. This, some version of this image I've been making since seventh grade. Um, and so that's also part of it is that with, you can just play with squares and circles constantly. And I can, and I have, and that's with my own personal therapy. So this book, you're hoping that art therapists will buy and use with their clients. Yes. And anyone that's interested in safely exploring art with their clients that maybe doesn't know how, therapists all the time, verbal therapists come to me and say, what can I do with my client that has nothing to talk about? And I suggest other people's books that are full of directives. And now I can recommend my own book. So even if someone isn't certified as an art therapist, you're right. saying if you are a good therapist and have a little bit of consultation, you can use this book in your practice. Yes. So I've heard some art therapy people say, or just maybe maybe non-art therapists say, that you shouldn't do art therapy unless you're trained. Yeah, I would. So the concept of what is art therapy is huge, and even within the community of art therapists, some people would say that this is not art therapy. Mm -hmm. That handing a client a coloring sheet and saying fill it in is too controlled and it doesn't really allow the client to really enter that subconscious space. So this might be considered by some to be art therapy light or really directive based um, and it's you're really steering the client in a certain direction. The prompts here are pretty visual um, even though clients will have their own experience within that a lot of the guesswork has been taken out um, so they it would just be like handing out a math sheet in a math class like everything in here with my experience is pretty harmless pretty guaranteed towards success um, it'll go as deep as the client is willing to go but these are pretty much geared towards success yeah, I mean, as a non-art therapist myself, I've used art or activities in therapy, particularly with kids who don't want to talk and they want to draw, right. and have used the art that they draw as a jumping off point to talk about things. It's like, oh, what are you drawing there? And um, But I wouldn't call myself doing art therapy. Great. So there are a lot of people out there who are looking for ways to experiment in the session with their client maybe verbally you've kind of hit a wall and any of the prompts in this book would be a great exercise to do. I've also geared them towards the traditional struggles that clients have, like there's a whole set that are just circles with word prompts in the middle like calm and chaos, with and without, these kind of classic dichotomies that people find themselves in. Hmm. Like choosing your breakfast cereal, that kind of Right, oatmeal, eggs, problem. <laughs> Like, I care. So, let's... So, what's the directive with, with these guys? So, I, many clients come in and say, you know, I wish my life was calm, but I don't even know what that would look like. And so, what I'll do in a session is draw a perfect circle freehand and write the word calm in the middle and hand it to the client and say, fill this in with whatever calmness means to you. The circle gives some level of containment, and the word calm is just a constant prompt to keep people focused on what we're trying to do. Um, can we try it? Yeah, I have something else I was going to do with oh, you. Oh, okay, but, we can try something else. Um, and I should say, too, I know that people are going to photocopy this book over and over again. I have photocopies that I've been working with for 15 years. I've, I'm kind of paying it forward <laughs> into the therapist, teacher, universe, I know that we all have long days with time we need to fill. So I know that you're going to be photocopying out of this book, and I'm totally fine with that. So just one person needs to buy this, and then they can photocopy They can it. photocopy the bejesus out of it. I have pre-picked a directive to do with you. 
which is the butterfly life cycle. Okay. So it's drawn in the book, but I have to admit that in the session itself, um, and you can buy these on most science websites, this is the life cycle in three dimensions. You can tell that I <laughs> drew directly from these into the book. But what I ask people to do is to pick an issue in their lives, and we're going to frame it in the life cycle of the butterfly. And would this have been something you reacted to? Like I said, hey, I'm dealing with blah. And you would have said, hmm, that sounds like the butterfly life cycle could help. Or would this be more of a general tool that you would use to help discover what my issues might be? Uh, it's more if there's an issue that people have been chewing on over and over again and they feel like they're stuck and they're never going to mm -hmm. change. I think that the butterfly life cycle is a great metaphor that these small changes happen and that wherever you are is okay. Mm -hmm. So I have a client who actually told me this metaphor about how if you cut into a cocoon, it'll look like total chaos inside and the butterfly won't survive. You have to let the cocoon mm -hmm. complete its natural cycle in order to get a butterfly and I've had another client tell me that when butterflies come out, they're not really quite ready yet. They're wet, you know, mm -hmm. and it takes a long, mm -hmm. it takes a while for their wings to crystallize. So even within these processes, there's so much interesting kind of rich uh. stuff. Um, so often, like if somebody's in a breakup that's very painful. I will lay these out. And what's fun about the three-dimensional models is people can really turn them over in their hands and think about, oh, even though I feel like I've gone nowhere in processing my breakup, really I'm in the cocoon stage. And then I have them draw their own version of what stage they feel like they're in. So how, how would we approach this? I, you would ask me to pick a stage or? Well, let's pick an issue oh, okay. first. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's see. Um, let's we could talk about uh, you know changing jobs because mm -hmm. I've had the same job for the very very long time. I've been a, a um, cryptozoologist, and uh, but I, I'm feeling like it might be time for me to switch jobs, mm -hmm. and this is a difficult decision because I've been in the same kind of situation, same type of uh, job duties, etc. I feel comfortable with it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's no longer fulfilling, and so, but it's scary to change, and change might even involve me relocating or doing something. Um, I need you to use this uh, intervention to make him not move, because I know that'll mean bad things for all of us. Yes. So can you do so, that? So you know, <laughs> you know I'm powerful. I'm going to only try to use my power for good. For good. Oh. Art therapy hypnotize him. Yeah. <laughs> in Seattle. Only in Seattle. Oh, I think I'll stay in California. Oh, wait. Seattle. <laughs> so if you were going to think about this job search, where do you, or the even, you might even be in the pre-contemplative stage of change. Um, which of these four stages... Do you feel like best so, symbolizes where you're at? Because it's been a while since I took biology. Is this an egg or something? That is a gigantic This is an egg. egg. So a butterfly would lay something like mm -hmm. this. I mean, smaller. But. Yes. And this thing would give rise to the caterpillar here. Right. And this thing would eventually cocoon itself. Yes. And then it would give rise to this thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you want to try it on the page and see sure. what your own cocoon looks like? Okay, um, so I'm going to draw a cocoon. Yeah. So, and I brought really fancy crayons. Uh, these are water soluble, fancy, one step up, well, way up from wax, regular wax crayons. So you might notice that they feel a little different. Mm, fancy, okay. So I, I'm gonna draw my cocoon. Yeah. My personal cocoon, mm -hmm. okay. I'm gonna draw it from the inside. Okay. If looking from the inside of my cocoon, I kind of may not realize that I'm in a cocoon at some times, and I'm very distracted. Mm. Now here I kind of literally went to some of the real life distractions that I might be dealing with, like this latest movie or um, Breaking Bad or something, and then like social network here and playing a video game here. Um, a first person shooter, no less. Yeah, 
Right. Could that's right. I thought it'd be GTA and then, five. Yeah, it could be GTA five, that's right. And then here I am in my command center chair. Mm-hmm. And I am I don't know that I'm comfy anymore because these like armrests are kinda <laughs> high. Um I don't know why I drew myself blue. I'm not sure if there's a reason there. Um, and this thing is completely sealed off from the outside. And like, mm. there's this like black barrier, like imagine like thick black uh, covers on your windows or something. But then I was starting to think like, but there's, there's some important stuff happening out here that I cannot see through that black barrier. Mm -hmm. um, oh, the other thing about this is that I'm all by myself in here. Mm -hmm. That's so. the nature of cocoons, isn't it? Yeah. But I guess I could have, I mean, I could have drawn myself with, like, you can imagine yourself, like, like you feel like you and your team are, or you and your friend are, or something. But isn't it interesting that you stuck with the actual metaphor of the cocoon, which mm -hmm. is that we are by ourselves, inherently right. in that transformational process. There's something very specific to us mm -hmm. in it. I guess the, the thing that comes to mind, because this, this isn't, like, far from the truth in the sense that I'm very media occupied, I'm very uh, absorbed by media, and that might give me the illusion of being in this state still or something, mm -hmm. you know, in the caterpillar state. But it is in this weird way isolating or something. I kind of feel like I see this thing here, <laughs> and I might think, well, cool, that's different. But I might not realize that it's like out here or like mm. it's a reflection or something, you know? Mm -hmm. There's definitely there's definitely something not right. Like there's some sort of discomfort, some sort of stress, some sort of thing which is um, making all this like not right. So when clients say that one way to do that would be to pick a color that you really don't like and add that into the environment. Okay, you're on it. Purple. On I'm not a purple fan. Yeah, I'm gonna do this, and this, I think, might represent it well. There is definitely an urgency and a fear, and time is my nemesis. Mm -hmm. Time is my nemesis. Because we're all gonna die. There's that. Uh, the environment, I am always late. Uh, I struggle with time. <laughs> time is my nemesis. I seriously, I feel every night I feel like I needed another day to do today, mm. so. You stay up late because you don't want to go to bed. That's right, yeah. So I've always felt that it's like, I, yeah, that's ever since I was a kid, I remember feeling like I don't want the day to end and then and, and that feeling of like, oh, but I didn't get enough done today. <laughs> and so this is, this could be, this could be the metaphor for most of my life right here. I'm watching mm -hmm. a lot of these things, the clock's ticking. I'm kind of comfy in a seat, but I'm also, yeah, missing out on some important cues. You know, the other thing happening is this, there's, there is. So your cocoon doesn't get to open in its natural time? There's no, 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 no. Well, that could be too, but in this case. Someone's trying to get in? There are people trying to get my attention. They're yeah. trying to distract me from my cocoon. Mm -hmm. So how does it change the image to have these characters there? I do feel alone in here but I don't feel alone in my surroundings. But the, the aloneness that I don't feel isn't all good. Like some of it feels imposing or threatening. That's a messy cocoon. Yeah. Does it but feel it's fun though, cause, see, cause you're watching right. fun shows. It's got good stuff. So does it feel complete? <laughs> I'm not, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's ve definitely um, veered away from like the initial representation, but as soon as you asked me to draw the cocoon, this okay. is what came to mind. So I would say that's a great place to start. In what way is your cocoon different than a traditional cocoon? Well, I don't, I don't see what change is happening in here. Mm -hmm. Whereas I guess here there's at least some change happening. Mm -hmm. Would you say this image makes you want to stay in the cocoon or get out of the cocoon? <sighs> at least makes me want to change what's happening inside of the cocoon okay. to start with. Mm -hmm. Through periods of my adult life, certainly as a, as a kid, I was addicted to television. Mm -hmm. But even as an adult, I've gone through waves where I, uh, I was depressed and I, and, I, and I relied on detached media consumption mm -hmm. a lot. 
Um, I don't think I'm in that state anymore, partially because I, I, I actually don't have enough time to be. Um, but it doesn't mean that I'm not, like, part of the, and then maybe this is how it ties back to the, to the potential need to change my, my um, cryptozoology mm -hmm. career choice, or, or at least the department I work in. Because here's what happens. The time that I could be allocating, I end up feeling so exhausted that I end up sitting and just, just I, I don't have energy for anything mm -hmm. else. Right. So I am feeling like, well, I need to make some changes so that, I mean, time's going to keep on ticking. That's into the future, you know, you know that. But I, I, I might end up getting more, a little more energy back to be able to make some better decisions or something like that, mm -hmm. you know. If this were a session, uh -huh. Rebecca was your therapist, and she gave you this to do, would this be a valuable session for you? Uh, for me, yes. Uh, but then I, I'm an, I tend to be an easy customer for these type of things, because I, I, I in inherently enjoy talking about things like this, and, and drawing makes it even funner. But I think most uh, people like to draw if they feel comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. And most people like to talk about what they're struggling with. I mean, I would say, did the metaphor make you think about it any differently than you would have normally thought about it? I, I mean, there's, okay, so first of all, we're being filmed, so I, I might be uh, a little self-aware about mm -hmm. what I'm saying and things like that. Um, that said, I don't think this would be too far from, like, if we were really doing this, I probably would end up with something very similar to this. Mm -hmm. So, does, yes, the, the answer is yes, I would find this valuable. Does drawing it out bring out different thoughts and feelings and experiences for you? Yes, and actually I almost feel like I would want to draw many of these, like try it again, like start over sure. and be like... And I think it's interesting to think if we had tried on the same exercise and you had picked the caterpillar, how oh, would that right. change the story? That's if you were very still fascinating. hungry and consuming and <laughs> puttering along. Yes. Um, and in a way more vulnerable, I mean, I think what's the most interesting for me about this image is that the shell of the cocoon is the most, Im is so important. That That's interesting, yeah. You know, and there are times in my life where I have felt like a butterfly, and mm -hmm. there are times in my life where I felt like a caterpillar. I don't know if I felt like an egg, but maybe at the initial times of some things. <laughs> we live in a culture that really judges beginners and gives no room to be mm -hmm. at the beginning and be, you know, lost and confused and just starting. We live in an expert culture. Like, do you know I have to memorize every crypto animal? What is cryptozoology again? Isn't it the study of the fake animals, like the Loch Ness monster? Loch Ness, yes. Yeti, Sasquatch, yes. Bigfoot. I should know this because I've been doing right. it for years, but I guess I'm an egg. <laughs> Well, and lucky for us, the Yeti was discovered to really be a gigantic prehistoric polar bear. So. I saw that you posted that. Wait, on wait, Facebook. wait, what? She posted this on Facebook uh, yesterday, I think. So I'm, I am also obsessed with, with cryptozoology. cryptozoology and, As I have been for many years. And the Yeti is my favorite. Who is, really? Yes. And it turns out that the Yeti now was probably a gigantic prehistoric polar bear. Uh, I mean, I do know about this because it's my field. So, <laughs> yes, of course. That's right. So, Rebecca, thanks for coming on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Every time you come on the show, it's a breath of fresh air, don't you think? Yes, although now I feel all warm and cozy in my cocoon. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm, I'm eternally fascinated by art therapy. And I learned today that it's okay for me to occasionally use art directives, even though I'm not an art therapist. I think you can safely use the exercises in my book. Awesome. And what's the name of the book again? A Square the Circle Art Therapy Workbook. And selling for about $13 on Amazon. About $13 on Amazon or um, Book Locker at the publisher. Awesome. Oh, and if you want to buy it in bulk, go to Book Locker and get a major discount, especially if you buy 100 Well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks Woo! for joining us, and please... We're number one! Please take care of yourself. We're number one! We're number Seattle's one. number one! Remember, oh. Seattle's number one in oh. sales of the book. And All like right. Things. We're number one! <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and something. Yes. All right. <laughs>